Today's Mr. Ballon video has the tagline that says, What happened to their heads? will leave you terrified for yourself. In brackets, star warning. This is going to be a mature audience one. Do we care? Do we balls? Let's check it out. As always, let's see what Mr. Barlin does to the like button. Let's get it. Today, I'm going to tell you two wild medical mysteries. But okay. before we get into those stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do and we upload once a week. So if that's of interest to you, please invite the like button to your wedding, but give them the wrong date, time, and location. Also, that could be doing it a favor. <laughs> invite the like button to your wedding, but give them the wrong date, time, and location. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications Absolutely do so you that. don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's stories. Okay, let's get into today's stories. A mouthful. <laughs> let's go. Around 1 p.m. on August 6th, 2011, a 32-year-old seafood vendor named Carla Flores stood in the entryway of her home, balancing a tray of shrimp in one hand and waving goodbye to her three kids with the other. She told her kids she'd be right back, and then she stepped out the front door onto the streets of Culiacan, which is a major city in northwestern Mexico. Right. Carla was going to deliver this tray of shrimp to one of her regular customers. She walked down an alleyway and then onto a main road, and then eventually into a neighborhood with a whole bunch of brightly colored houses. She went okay. up to one of them and knocked on the door. Real of the a homes. man answered, and Carla handed him the tray of shrimp. He took the shrimp, gave her a handful of cash. She thanked him and turned and headed back down towards the street. And Carla had made it all the way back to the alleyway right near her house when suddenly she heard this loud sound, and then before she could figure out what it was, this small, hard object smashed into her right cheek, and it hit her so hard she fell onto the pavement. And so instinctively, Carla reached up and she touched her cheek, and she felt a warm, wet liquid. Yeah, she looked at her hand, and it was covered in blood. Carla tried to get up, but her ears were ringing, and she felt dizzy, and then suddenly, everything went black. Oh, 20 what? minutes later, a receptionist at Culiacan General Hospital watched as a man carried a bloody, unconscious woman into the emergency room. He laid her down on a bench in the waiting area, and then he just turned around and began walking back out again. The what do you reckon's happened to this girl? Something smacked her in the face, blood, knocked out. Hey, okay. I'm intrigued, Mr. Bowen. You've got me. Uh, you've got me on the hook. Let's go on a bench in the waiting area, and then he just turned around and began walking back out again. Get the receptionist him, jumped up and chased after this guy, demanding to know what was going on with this woman. Who is she? What happened to her? What are you doing? But the guy just said, "Look, I was driving down the road and I saw this woman bloody in the streets, and so I brought her here. I promise you, that's all I know." And then he turned and kept on walking, and the receptionist went back inside to check on the woman. The receptionist looked down at the woman. She was unconscious, her mouth was hanging open, and the entire right side of her face was totally mangled. And then embedded in this mess on the right side of her cheek, basically in her head, was this weird dark colored object, but she couldn't tell what it was. And she didn't have time to stand around trying to find it? out. So she called for help and a couple of nurses came running out of the emergency room and together they lifted this woman up, put her on a gurney and wheeled her back to see a doctor. A few moments later, Dr. Gustavo Mesa walked into Carla's hospital room. He'd been briefed on her condition, but when he went inside, she was no longer unconscious. Now her eyes were wide open and she looked totally confused. Dr. Mesa could tell Carla was having trouble breathing and she couldn't close her mouth. But then Carla began making this grunting sound. And at first the doctor couldn't understand what she was saying, but then it became clear she was saying rock, rock, rock. And Dr. Rock, Mesa's okay. first thought was, oh, she's telling me she was hit by a yeah, rock. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. what's caused her injury. And so Dr. Mesa leaned in and looked at her wound and he caught a glimpse of what looked like a dark colored stone buried inside of her cheek. Dr. Mesa thought, you know, wow, she must have been hit so hard by this rock, this stone, for it to get buried that far inside yeah. of her face. He promised Carla he would get it out, but first he told her she would have to undergo an x-ray to really figure out where it was in her skull and how exactly they'd be able to get it out. A few minutes- How did it get there though? How did a stone hit her in the face and be embedded 
It, that would have had to have taken some force, that. Minutes later, Dr. Mesa stood in the radiology department looking over Carlo's x-ray images. And it was immediately clear to him and all the other medical staff that what was in Carlo's cheek was not a rock. No. Because the object was shaped like an oval, it had round edges, and it was perfectly symmetrical. To Dr. Mesa, it just seemed far too uniform to be a rock. But he didn't have a better guess for what it was. All he could tell from the x-ray was this object had broken Carla's upper and lower jaw yeah. and shattered several of her teeth. And now this object was stuck between her broken jaw bones. Dr. Mesa knew it was going to take surgery to what get this he? thing out, but he needed more information before he felt confident operating. So he ordered a CAT scan of Carla's head to give him a more detailed picture of this object. Show it when us, the Mr. results Bowen. came in and Dr. Mesa looked at the image, his face went pale. He couldn't believe what he was looking at, but the proof was right there in front of him, and he knew he would have to do something and fast. So Dr. Mesa ran to the nearest nurse's station and told the nurse to evacuate everybody from the emergency room. Then he grabbed the hospital phone. It's not a, it's not a grenade. Evacuating people, it's rounded. Is it like a grenade or a bomb? And she's caught it in her mouth and it's not gone off. Get out of it. And he dialed a military official. Less than an hour later, Carla was no longer in the hospital. She was now out in the middle of a grassy field, laying on her back, absolutely terrified. And they're gonna, anesthesiologist. They're, they're gonna bomb squad her head. They're gonna put one of them, them big domes over her head, screw it down and blow her up. <laughs> just walked up to her and injected a local anesthetic into her cheek. And suddenly, the agonizing pain that Carla had felt ever since waking up in the hospital was now gone. But her absolute terror was not. Carla knew there were two doctors and a nurse standing by to perform an operation on her, but also there were two army soldiers just a few feet away from her staring at her. Carla saw a doctor start to bring a scalpel toward her face and she had to close her eyes to keep from flinching. She heard the soldiers giving directions and the clinking of surgical instruments. And all the while, Carla kept her eyes shut tight and just tried to pretend none of this was even happening. And after what felt like a lifetime, Carla felt a shift inside of her face. And it was the doctors and nurses pulling this object out of it's her cheek. Carla opened her eyes and right above her head, she saw the doctor holding the bloody thing they had just removed it's from her face. It was a live grenade. That's why she was being operated on, not in the hospital, but out in this open field. Because if it did go off mid-operation, it would at least limit casualties. And that's also why the military was called in to tell the medical staff <laughs> how to handle this live how piece of get there, though? in the middle of the operation. After the grenade was safely removed from Carla's face, it was disposed of by the army soldiers. It's believed that the grenade that hit Carla was fired out of a grenade launcher. That would explain the loud sound she heard in the alleyway before it hit her in the face. Okay, Luckily though, the grenade's fuse that should have ignited and caused it to explode didn't work. So even though it, it absolutely does. was a live grenade, it didn't explode it and does. so it didn't kill her. It's unknown who shot the grenade, why they shot it, or whether Carla was the intended target or simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. Carla would ultimately wow, lose that. half her teeth, she would undergo multiple reconstructive surgeries, and she would be left with a huge scar on her right cheek. But she said she was just happy to be alive. That's brutal, that, isn't it? Look at that picture. Wow. Wow, that is crazy. She would be left with a huge scar on her right cheek. But she said she was just happy to be alive. Yeah. And she was forever grateful to the stranger who brought her to the hospital and to the medical team and the army soldiers who risked their lives to save her. Jesus. If you don't know this, can you imagine someone telling you <laughs> that you've got a bomb in your face? Whole new means of the words blowing your top, like, isn't it? You know what I mean? Well, this one. It's called All In Their Head, when the last one was All In Her Head. But you can see why it was called Mouthful. <laughs> Let's go. All In Her Head. Wow. One morning in the spring of 1982, oh, old, mother rushed to the reception desk at the Royal London Hospital in England, <laughs> oh, cradling her six-week-old baby girl named Claire. 
Claire was her first and only child, and like a lot of first-time parents, the mother was very paranoid about her daughter's health. And so anytime there was a change in her behavior or her appearance changed, it was like this mom rushed to the doctor. And that morning, the mother had noticed something very unusual on her daughter's head. There were two raised white lines that made the shape of a plus sign. There was one line that ran from the nape of her neck all the way in back, all the way up her head to her forehead, and the other line was horizontal, and it went from behind one ear all the way to the other ear. Right. Now, this mother had no idea what these lines were, what they meant, what caused them, and so as soon as she saw them, she scooped her kid up and she headed to the hospital. Now, in the past, every time this mother had brought Claire to the hospital, the visit always ended with, your child is just fine. But this time, when the receptionist saw Claire's head and saw those lines, she immediately said, those do not look normal. And so she handed the mother some paperwork and told her they would get Claire to a neurologist as soon as they could. Right. 15 minutes later, the mother stood in an exam room and watched as the hospital's pediatric neurologist, Dr. Farhad Afshar, examined Claire's head. And after a moment, Dr. Afshar stepped back and he explained to the mother that these raised lines on her daughter's head were something known as bulging fontanelles. So when a baby is born, the bones of their skull are not actually fused no, together. Not. And the thin gap- I know this because it's all plates that come together. A bit like, um, it, like it grows over, doesn't it? And then they fuse together. And I knew that. That's why, you, you know, babies can come out of like the- the mum with like misshaped heads because things can still move. Gaps between these separate skull bones are called fontanelles. Yeah. And Dr. Afshar told Claire's mom that when a baby's fontanelles begin to bulge like this, it's usually because the child's brain is so swollen that it's beginning to push the skull push bones apart. Yeah. Dr. Afshar told Claire's mom that she had made the right decision to bring her daughter to the hospital. But he was clear that a lot of things can cause a baby's brain to swell and potentially cause these bulging fontanelles. And so in order to figure out what was going on, they would need to order a CAT scan. Claire's mom felt uneasy, but she said, okay. And so they did the CT scan. And then a few minutes later, Dr. Afshar came back into the room with the results. And with a grave expression on his face, he told Claire's mother that he had some terrible news. Her daughter had a brain tumor. Oh, Hearing this, shit. Claire's mom felt like the entire world was crumbling all around her. She was terrified for her terrible. daughter and she had a million questions. But before she could ask any of them, Dr. Afshar said, there's something else. He said that normally brain tumors are made up of brain cells, but based on the CT scan, it looked like Claire's tumor inside of her brain was made partially of fat and partially of bone. Dr. Afshar said he had never seen anything like this and couldn't even begin to explain it. But I wonder if it's a birth defect. You know where certain things go wrong, like like when you get Siamese twins and stuff like that. We always but the they, they've not separated properly when they, obviously when you're supposed to have twins, like the I don't know what they call the cells are not divided properly. And they, you know, it might be something to do like like that where it's got bone and fat in it, where it, it should be somewhere else in the body or something. Like that. I wonder if it's something like that. Dr. Afshar said know. he had never seen anything like this and couldn't even begin to explain it. But the one thing he did know is that whatever this thing was, it had to come out of Claire. Leaving it inside of her head could, at a minimum, cause serious neurological damage or at worst, could even kill the child. Yeah, yeah. So Dr. Afshar told Claire's mom you that she only operate. had really one option. Claire needed brain surgery. Yeah. Even though the operation was very risky for a child as young as Claire was, it was the only way they could figure out what this mass actually was, and it was the only way to get it out. Soon after their conversation, Dr. Afshar was standing in the operating room with Claire sedated, laying face down on the table in front of him. With Mr. Barn stories, there's always a mad, mad twist or something. I want to know what this is and why it's in there. And it's going to be a sinister reason. And it's going to be something that you are totally not going to expect. But I want to know what it is. Dr. Afshar made an incision across the back of Claire's head. Then he cut a rectangle into her skull, essentially creating a small door. He opened up that door to see the bottom of Claire's brain. He delicately moved the left and right hemispheres of Claire's brain slightly apart so he could reach the section where the tumor was. And that's when he got his first glimpse of this strange mass. He grabbed it with a pair of surgical tongs and gently tugged. And he was surprised at how easily it began to slide out. And slowly it came into the light. And when Dr. Afshar finally got a full look at what this thing was. What do you reckon it is? What do you reckon it is? Let me know in the comments. 
<laughs> I'm not gonna say, I'm not gonna scooby do me, I'm not gonna clue. He was so stunned, he just froze, staring at this thing that seemed impossible. And so after setting this strange mass aside, Dr. Offshar closed her skull, stitched her head up, and then sent her to the pediatric ICU. Claire laid unconscious in a hospital bed with her mother by her side for weeks. Meanwhile, Dr. Offshar ordered a genetic test on the mass he had removed from Claire's brain. And it turned out, Claire was not an only child like her mother thought. She was actually a twin. And the mass that Dr. Offshar had twin. removed from Claire's brain was her twin sibling's fetus. Claire had wow, an extremely wow. rare condition called fetus in fetu. Fetus in fetu occurs in the very early stages of a twin pregnancy when cells don't divide properly and one fetus becomes enveloped by the other. I've just said that. When the, um, when the cells don't divide properly. No way. That's two out of two for me. <laughs> I got a bomb the cells and the cells don't divide divided. properly Not and divided. one fetus becomes enveloped by the other. The yeah. enveloping twin looks like a single baby, but they're actually born with their sibling's partially developed fetus wow. still inside of their body. The fetus in Claire's head was five and a half inches long. It had two arms, two legs, but its head hadn't formed yet. And Claire's case was extra rare because her twin's fetus was found inside of her skull. Yeah. In all of global medical history, intracranial fetus in fetu had only ever been recorded 18 other times. And it was right. thought to be a fatal diagnosis because to this point, all the others who had it had died. Wow. But after two weeks in the ICU, Claire woke up. Wow. And a week after that, she was healthy enough to go back home. And by 18 months old, she had fully recovered and had no lingering neurological problems. What? As far as the medical literature suggests, Claire was the first person to ever survive having her own twin removed from her brain. Look at that. Look at it. Wow. That is absolutely crazy. Crazy. I am so glad there's a positive spin on this story and that somebody survived because that could have been absolutely catastrophic, couldn't it? Bonus story. Ready for more head trauma? Here's a bonus story that's been remastered for you. Remastered. Does that mean it's a story from a while back that he's redone? Sparks fly. Bonus story for Mr. Ballin. In July of 1848, a 25-year-old man named Phineas Gage got a job working construction on the Hudson River Railroad in New York. At right. this time in America, railroads were being laid all over the country, and so lots of workers like Phineas were needed to blast rock out of the way to lay down these railroad tracks. And as it happened, Phineas was an expert in explosives. He had learned how to set controlled blasts growing up on his family's farm in New Hampshire, and then later in his life, he had worked in a mine blasting through rock. Right. And so in addition to just being the ideal railroad worker for this time in America, when Phineas actually started working in New York on this railroad, his co-workers immediately started looking up to him. Phineas was extremely smart and energetic. He was this incredible conversationalist. He was charismatic and funny and a natural leader. And so just two months into starting this new job, it was no surprise to anyone who knew Phineas or worked with Phineas that he was promoted to blasting form which meant Phineas would lead the explosives team. Okay. Phineas was so excited about this promotion that he went to a blacksmith and had a custom tamping iron made. A tamping iron is a long metal rod that's used to pack explosives. When railroad workers wanted to blast through, let's say, a big rock, they would start by drilling a deep but skinny hole in the rock, then they would pour blasting powder inside, then they'd put a fuse inside, and then using this tamping iron, they would push the blasting powder and the fuse deep into this hole inside of this rock or whatever it was they were yeah. blowing up. And then once it was packed, they would ignite it. Usually, tamping irons were sort of rough tools that looked like crowbars, but Phineas really wanted something special to commemorate this promotion. And so Phineas had the blacksmith make this perfectly straight, smooth, four foot long metal tamping Beautiful. iron. Okay. And on one end was a pointed side and on the other was a blunted side. And this rod, it weighed about 13 pounds and it was about an inch and a quarter in diameter. And Phineas loved this tamping iron. He brought it with him, not just to work, but basically anywhere he went. 
On September 3rd, 1848, so not long after Phineas's big promotion, Phineas and his explosives team were blasting through some rock that ran through a forest. It's a bit of a, a strange tool to be carrying around with you all the time. I mean, I get that you like a certain tool to do a certain job, but to be that obsessed with it to walk around with a tool like that. Okay, okay, whatever floats your boat, Phineas. And his explosives team were blasting through some rock that ran through a forest. And Phineas, he was right up front over the blasting site, helping them prep the explosive. His team had drilled that long, deep, skinny hole into the rock they were about to blow up. Yeah. And then blasting powder was put inside, a fuse was put inside. And then Phineas took his tamping iron and began packing the powder and fuse deep into the rock. And the way he did this is he used the blunt end yeah, yeah. of his tamping iron to pack the explosives, which meant the pointed end was sticking out of the rock. And so as Phineas is doing this, someone behind him slipped on a rock. One of his men tripped or something. And so Phineas, with his hands kind of on his tamping iron, turned to the right to look and see what was going on. And when he did this, somehow his tamping iron that was inside of this skinny hole must have nudged against the inside of the rock, created a spark, and ignited the explosive inside of the rock. Oh, which meant shit. the tamping iron was basically fired like a missile out of this hole into Phineas's head. It went in his cheek, up behind his left eye, up and out of his skull, and then shot 80 feet away, landing on the ground, covered in Phineas's blood and brains. This Have we done this one? That seems very, very familiar. The whole situation of it going through his head. Kelly says we have, but it's remastered. So, we may as well continue. <laughs> feet away, landing on the ground, covered in Phineas's blood and brains. This happens so quickly that for a second, after this thing has blown through Phineas's head, Phineas just stood there upright with his eyes wide, and then suddenly a geyser of blood began shooting out of the top of his head, wow. and then Phineas fell backwards onto the ground. When Phineas's body hit the ground, he began having a seizure, yeah, at yeah. which point his co-workers, who were still kind of shaken up from this sudden blast, they rushed over and tried to kind of position him in a way that he wouldn't hurt himself. But I mean, they're looking at him and he's, he's literally dead. missing half of his head. He's covered in blood. And they're thinking, you know, there's nothing we can do for him, but basically wait for him to die. And so all of Phineas's co-workers who adored Phineas just stood there very somber watching their boss die. But eventually Phineas stopped having a seizure and then he opened his eyes and he looked up at his crew and he sat up and he said, what happened? Now remember, half of his head has been blown out by a 13 pound, four foot long metal rod that has shot through his head. And his wow. co-workers, when they heard how clearly he was speaking. I forgot this story. That that blast and the, the, the spike going through his head was very familiar, but I forgot what happens with this story. So it's good. <laughs> shot through his head. And his co-workers, when they heard how clearly he was speaking and how focused his eyes were, I mean, they couldn't believe it. How in the world is this guy alive, let alone having a coherent yeah. conversation with them? And so the co-workers told Phineas, please lie down, we'll get you help, lie down, relax. But Phineas, who still had blood also shooting out of his head, just kind of stood up casually and walked over to the railroad cart and signaled for his crew to take him back into town. And so the crew, they're looking over at Phineas, who now is Thank literally casual. head to toe, just red from blood, still bleeding, but less so. And he's just sitting on the railroad cart waiting for them. And so they walk over to him and they start the slow one mile journey into town on this railroad cart. And the whole time they're all kind of looking at Phineas, expecting him to die any second. But instead, Phineas is just kind of <laughs> looking around with half of his head. And at some point he pulled out his log book and carefully wrote down what time they were leaving their work site to make sure his crew was accurately paid. Can you imagine seeing that? You got a bloke there with like blood squirting out of his head. He's got a hole here and a hole there and so it's just gone flying through his head. And he's doing his normal everyday routine, apart from the fact that they're taking him to the hospital, but he's sitting there writing on a pad and jotting things down and saying that we're leaving the site and everything. Wow, can you imagine seeing that? 
on what time they were leaving their work site to make sure his crew was accurately paid. And then finally they reached town and Phineas was still very much alive and looking around, acting like nothing had happened to him. And the co-workers helped him to his hotel and Phineas just sat outside on a chair in front of his hotel, just people watching while his crew <laughs> went and got a doctor. A doctor soon arrived and he too was completely shocked at Phineas's appearance, but even more so was Phineas's eyes. He looked at the doctor and his eyes were totally focused, like he was all there, totally lucid, looking at the doctor, waiting for him to come over and help him out with his little injury. With his little injury. They do say that there's a large part of your brain that you don't use, isn't there? I don't use any of it, but that's beside the point. And they say there's a lot, a lot of your brain you don't use. And I wonder if this is the parts that you don't use. I wonder how lucky he was. He's going to say it's like an, he's, he's like a millimeter away from hitting something like that, was, that would have made him like die straight away. Totally lucid, looking at the doctor, waiting for him to come over and help him out with his little injury. Little injury. And when the doctor kind of timidly approached Phineas, Phineas very famously said as he sat on his chair, Doctor! Here's business enough for you. Like everyone else, the doctor fully assumed that despite Phineas's miraculous recovery from this injury, that he would soon die from this horrific wound in his head. And so the doctor moved Phineas up into the hotel, put him in a bed, and then basically made him comfortable. Now, the doctor at this point was not trying to save Phineas. He felt like there was nothing he could do to save Phineas. At this point, it was like mercy. Let's make this as pain-free as possible for Phineas as he inevitably dies from this injury. But I mean, it was the 1800s though, and medicine then was it, wasn't it? <laughs> Put some deadly nightshade in it and crack on. ...free as possible for Phineas as he inevitably dies from this injury. But Phineas didn't die. He would break out of it and basically be okay again. However, his personality at first, after he came out of this state of delirium, was not really the same. No longer was he this funny, smart, charming, confident leader. Instead, he was this guy who seemed to have lost all of his inhibitions and was kind of childlike. He swore right, all the time. Okay. He would tell people uh, he had these this. crazy plans he was going to go do, but he would never yeah. follow through with them. And he would tell his nieces and nephews these wild stories about himself that were obviously made up and not even close to reality. But overall, he was okay, even though you could see his brain pulsing underneath his skin on the side of his head that had been blown off. And within a couple of years of this injury, those changes to Phineas's personality kind of faded, and he really did become old Phineas. Wow. However, there was one unique quirk to Phineas post-injury that never went away. And that was Phineas's kind of unhealthy love for the tamping iron that had blown through his head. <laughs> After his injury, Phineas kind of stopped making friends and any friends he did have, he really didn't try to keep those relationships up. Yeah, he didn't get married, this, he didn't yeah. get kids. Instead, the tamping iron became sort of like his best friend. He took it everywhere with him, even posing at one- Real photo, is, is that like that because of the shot through his head? There's, some, there's a scar on his forehead, and there's a scar across his cheek. Wow. It's crazy. It was sort of like his best friend. He took it everywhere with him, even posing at one point with the tamping iron, the way you would expect a couple to pose for a photo. Twelve years after his horrific injury, Phineas would develop seizures, likely from the injury, yeah. and then he would die yeah. with his beloved tamping rod right by his side. His case changed neuroscience forever by showing really? that an injury to the brain could affect specific personality traits. Today, Phineas's skull and his tamping rod are on display at Harvard Medical School. Look at that. Look at the size of that rod. Look how much it would have taken out in that one smack. Jesus, how does it last 12 years? And oh now a clip God. from Mr. Ballin. That is absolutely insane. I mean, every single story, the first one with the grenade in the mouth, the second one, the, uh, the, the, the iron through his head. I mean, crazy, crazy stories.
I mean, born with a feet, a, a, a twin in your head, and being the only person to survive that. I mean, I get when things happen, you they, they learn so there is positives. And there was positives even at the end of that one because he did get another 12 years of life, Phineas. But ultimately, you know, it did change science forever, it said. And then you've got the, the fetus one, the one who's, like I say, saved, uh, sa saved her life and, and removed it successfully. The first one ever to do that because the 18 before it died. And then in the first one, I mean, who the hell shoots a grenade in someone's mouth? <laughs> I mean, what the hell? What is going on? What's happened to their heads will leave you terrified for yourself. I certainly wouldn't, certainly wouldn't use a bloody a tamping iron. <laughs> I'm not going through my head, going through my eyes, through my brain, etc. I don't need any personality altering whatsoever. But it might stop me swearing. Or make me worse. Anyway, what did you guys think of this reaction? Let me know in the comments. Want to check out any more from Mr. Bollum. There'll be a playlist right up there. Don't forget to subscribe. But more importantly, don't forget to check out the original video. And I shall see you all next time.